Thomas Stewart, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from Pennsylvania, USA. You are an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Pennsylvania State University, an evolutionary and developmental biologist. You and your colleagues have just recently announced a new species of early tetrapod, Kikiktania, which, along with a famed Tiktaalik, gives us tantalizing clues about that time in the deep past when animals first ventured out of the water and on to land. So how are you doing, Thomas? Um, as with Tiktaalik back in 2006, the announcement to the world about Kikiktania has kept you very busy indeed. So um, how has this new discovery been uh, received? Thank you for having me. It's been exciting. It's really fun to work on a project where not only scientists, but also I think the public at large has investment in this. Um, and it's been fun to share these results really broadly. Well, before we get into the world of early tetrapods, let's just hear a little bit about your background. Thomas, did you always have an interest in science and in particular, the transition that early animals made from water to land? Well, I've always been interested in science and biology in particular, but this research topic of how fish left water about 375 million years ago, that's relatively new to me. So I grew up in upstate New York, uh, had a fish tank, went fishing all the time, always cared about fish, but it wasn't something that really focused my academic interests until I got to college. And there I was looking for the opportunity to work in a lab and I came across Dr. Craig Albertson's lab. He was a new professor working on cichlids and how their faces develop and how they evolve. And that was really eye-opening for me, how that you could use a natural system like the diversity of cichlids to understand basic fundamental problems in evolutionary theory. And that's what led me to graduate school, trying to understand how developmental systems evolve to explain broad patterns of diversity. I went and completed my PhD at the University of Chicago, where I was in the lab of Mike Coates and co-advised by Robert Ho. There I was studying skeletal origins and how we can use living fish, in particular catfishes, to understand the origin of new appendicular systems. So in our own bodies, we have arms and legs. These are mm -hmm. complex musculoskeletal systems. But if you look deep in the history of vertebrates, we can see a process of fin origin that shows a relatively simple structures that secondarily become elaborated in their form and function into the features that we see in our own limbs today. And so uh, that was my graduate studies, looking at macroevolutionary patterns of skeletal diversity, using living fishes to understand problems in deep history. And then when I completed my PhD, I went to Yale University, where I spent two years working in the lab of Gunter Wagner, doing developmental genetics of digits, trying to understand which genes are expressed in individual fingers within the fin or within the hand, excuse me, and how they differ between different groups of um, amniotes. And that work is really what brought me into the limb, in the limb world. Uh, and then after that tenure, I, I went to work in Neil Shubin's lab, looking at the fossil nice. record, trying to link fishes to tetrapods, trying to understand the origin of the anatomical features um, of our own bodies with those of tetrapodomorph fishes about uh, 375 million years ago. And so that's where this project developed, was my postdoc with Neil. Well, a good place to start on a journey is a definition of what a tetrapod is and why biologists like yourself focus on these creatures, but also on so-called fishopods. Thomas, can you give us an overview of this ancient time when fish ventured onto land and why it's so important to the study of evolution as well as to us human beings? Well, it sounds like a simple question, what is a tetrapod? But it's surprising that even among scientists, people use this word in very different ways. Some people use it to mean those animals that have fingers and toes, the hand or the foot. Um, other people use tetrapod to mean a group of animals that is a clade and a group that are closely related to each other. Um, and sometimes in that usage, it includes animals that might not have yet evolved fingers and toes, but are in the group very closely related to those first creatures that did. Uh, so when I use it, when I use the word early tetrapods, I tend to apply that to the clade level uh, strategy of, of the term. And early tetrapods to me includes some of these fishopods, some of these creatures right at the cusp 
of the water to land transition, like Tiktaalik, um, Alpistostegi, a number of other really famous fossils. And to explain that transition and the origin of tetrapods, we need to, as an anatomist, focus on two problems. And the first of those is the loss of fin rays. So in mm -hmm. fish fins, we see that their fin web, that distal part, sort of at the end of the fin, is yeah. supported yeah. by a set of bony elements called fin rays. Um, we do not have them in our skeleton. So in that fin to limb transition, fin rays were lost. The other major transition anatomically that explains the origin of tetrapods and the emergence of this new skeletal and anatomical type is the origin of digits. Uh, those are the fingers at the end of our appendages. And there's a lot of active work trying to understand how developmental systems changed to produce digits in the first tetrapods, uh, how those patterning systems relate to what we see in other living fishes or extinct fishes, uh, and how the fossil record can really inform specifically the order of changes involved in this fin to limb transition. Now, I've been sort of introducing the problem in an anatomical context, uh, but these were creatures at when this anatomical transition were happening that lived about 375 million years ago. And based on their geometry of their bones, the orientation of their joints, and the habitats in which we find these fossils, it's predicted that they were living right at the water's edge, oftentimes in floodplains in what would have been warm environments although now we find them in really cold places, including the Arctic. So uh, Tiktaalik, for example, one of the best known closest relatives of the first animals with hands and feet uh, was discovered in northern Canada on Ellesmere Island. And the new species, which we recently discovered and described, uh, was also found at those same localities. And not exactly the precise location, but just across the valley from where Tiktaalik was found, about a kilometer and a half away. Um, and oftentimes these fishes, the early tetrapods, those animals still with fins right at the edge of the, at the edge of the water, perhaps starting to leave the water, they were not as often depicted kind of small, sort of humble little creatures. They can be quite big. Tiktaalik was a few meters in length, a large piscivore, a predator, um, something that would have been, you know, roaming the near shore environment probably eating as much as it could. Understanding how these features originated is, for me at least, not strictly an exercise in explaining what happened in the past, but it really gives, uh, I think, a proper context to understand our own bodies and the bodies of many of the animals we live with and we're surrounded by. Cats, dogs, birds, frogs, we all share this common ground plan of having pairs of appendages on our trunk where at the end we have a series of small little skeletal rods, a series of segmented rods um, in the hands or in our feet. And the adaptation of this fundamental ground plan has been really critical to the diversification of lineages. So birds' wings are a modification of this ground plan that originated 375 million years ago, approximately, as fishes were leaving the water. And um, understanding how this originated is, in my mind at least, really critical to explaining the broad diversity of vertebrates, uh, including tetrapods. Yeah, because if we look at our own hands, I mean, they're not that much different to what Tiktaalik had, really, when you, when you look at it. Yeah, we have one bone that articulates with the girdle, um, the shoulder girdle or the pelvic girdle. We have two bones beyond that either the ulna and the radius or the tibia and the fibula, and then a series of small bones with at the end a series of segments and a number of them in parallel. Uh, that basic architecture, if you look deep in time and in the fossil record, you can find sort of the antecedents of many of those components in fishes uh, and trying to understand exactly how that originated, the context of that uh, character origin. That's part of what my lab focuses on. The way that we do that in addition to looking at fossils is by trying to understand in living fishes how genes that are expressed during skeletogenesis, during the formation of the skeleton in the embryo, how they are modulated, how they evolve, and how these genetic and developmental factors contribute to the generation of animal diversity. Well, the most famous of these fishopods is Tiktaalik, a clear transitional fossil of an animal that had adaptations for both living in water and walking on land. 
at the time the earliest of its kind ever found. This was discovered by your colleague Neil Shubin back in 2004 and turned out to be, quite rightly, a watershed moment for evolutionary biology. So for anyone who doesn't know, what is the story of Tiktaalik? Tiktaalik is an animal that is, I think, familiar to a lot of us now in paleontology, but still real, a relatively recent discovery. Uh, Neil Shubin, Ted Deschler, and colleagues were looking in the Arctic, trying to find animals that bridge the gap between water and land in the history of vertebrates. And they went to these sites in northern Canada, in the Nunavut Territory, and on Ellesmere Island specifically, because that was a part of the world that had exposures of rocks of the right age and of the right, ty right type. So they were looking for rocks that fit this timeline based on what we knew about the first animals with fingers like Ichthyostega and Acanthostega. They were looking in the late Devonian period. They wanted to hit a window of about 375 million years ago. And they were trying to find ecosystems where there would have been freshwater streams, perhaps sort of like an Amazonian kind of environment, warm places uh, with, it seems, a little bit of flooding as well. And those expeditions to look for sites just like that began in the late 1990s uh, and continued through the early 2000s. Although I should say that there are still ongoing efforts to try to return to uh, Ellesmere Island to continue doing collections. The first few efforts were not as successful as they would have hoped. They were looking for this particular paleo environment, these particular types of animals that they predicted would live there, um, and kind of kept missing the mark, either a little bit too marine or a little bit too shallow. And it wasn't until 2004 when they succeeded in finding these Opistostegalian animals, where Opistostegalians are the closest relatives of the first things with fingers and toes. And the material was discovered in 2004 and brought back to Philadelphia, where it was worked on at the museum, uh, physically prepared to expose a lot of this material. And uh, through that work, over the next couple of years, they discovered not only was this a new animal, uh, but it had many anatomical features that really placed it right at that cusp, right at this transitionary period in vertebrate history. So features that it had that distinguished it from fish, other fishes, for example, were the absence of a connection between the shoulder girdle and the head. Uh, that's a physical linkage that is found in many fishes that Tiktaalik lacks. It also lacks an operculum, which is this bony element at the back of the head, uh, and a number of features that are classically fish-like. And yet, it also preserves many of those features that we expect to see in fishes. It was obviously still breathing with its gills. It had a big hyoid. Um, it has fin rays at the end of its fins, again, distinguishing it from limbs, which lack fin rays. And yet, based on the overall geometry of its forelimbs, it seemed to be um, holding a position of sort of propped up on the ground based on the sort of articular surfaces of the humerus and the ulna and the radius. And this has kind of been called a push-up position, uh, suggesting that it would have been, again, oftentimes in physical contact with the substrate, uh, showing adaptations for load-bearing behaviors. Now, precisely whether or how or when it would have left the water is something that biomechanists, I think, are really well equipped to tackle. Um, but regardless of specifically how that happened, I think there's a lot of work trying to understand it. Um, it's clear that this was an animal that was adapting to live on the ground, perhaps walking underground, uh, on the ground underwater, excuse me, using its limbs in new ways. Uh, and again, fitting that really transitionary period between water and land and the early tetrapodomorph fishes, the early tetrapods, and the first tetrapods with fingers and toes. So Tiktaalik was discovered on an expedition in 2004, as I mentioned, but the efforts to really demonstrate that it was a new creature, to name it, uh, involved a series of conversations with the local indigenous community there, uh, the people of Ellesmere Island. And so Tiktaalik is a name that means basically large freshwater fish in the traditional language of the Inuit. And its name was uh, selected in conversation with members of that community. I think maintaining that relationship and sort of celebrating their contributions to this science and these discoveries is, is really an important part of the research. Uh, there's a lot to be learned about this period in the history on Earth. And these materials, which are so precious, really only are known to the scientific community because those communities 
have supported the efforts of scientists. And um, yeah, we're very thankful for that that collaboration and those those conversations. So really, Thomas, it is uh, Tiktaalik really is a smoking gun in terms of transitional fossils. <laughs> I think it's precisely the kind of animal you'd hope to discover if you're trying to demonstrate how evolution works and the way in which even animals that look quite different and occupy distinct ecological regimes, how they can transition from one state to the other. Uh, its anatomy is intermediate in many, many different ways in the way that its head is built, the way that its arms or fins are built, the way that its vertebrae are built. Uh, there's things that we're still describing, still learning from it that really just show how exceptionally, um, yeah, how exceptionally informative a taxon like this is if you're interested in how evolution works. This year, 2022, you and your colleagues announced a new fisher pod onto the scene, Kikiktania, a creature not unlike Tiktaalik, but with some intriguing differences. However, the most fascinating aspect of Kikiktania was hidden from view at first, isn't that right? Yeah, that's exactly the case. So I joined Neil's lab at a really exciting time. A graduate student at the time, Justin Lemberg, had been CT scanning as much of the Ellesmere Island fossil materials as he could. And he was working through Tiktaalik's skeleton, focusing on the head for his dissertation. Justin's work was really instrumental in sort of optimizing and learning how precisely we can scan these fossils to reveal anatomy that's still hidden within the matrix, hidden within the rock. And Justin continued on in the lab as a postdoc, and he and I were collaborating um, in you know, the tenure of my time in the lab. And one of the projects that had developed kind of as a side project, because we didn't know exactly what it would yield, was trying to understand the anatomy of a fossil, which now we call Kikiktanya, that was discovered in 2004. So this was an animal that was actually discovered the week before Tiktaalik was. It was discovered on that same expedition, but at a different locality. It was discovered across the valley, as I mentioned, about a kilometer and a half away. Mm. It comes from an older part of the deposit, um, though precisely how old, it's hard to say because we don't have um, dating throughout that time resolution. We only have the top and the bottom of the formation. Uh, but it's deeper in, in time, and it seemed to show from what was found initially an animal quite like Tiktaalik. So this is another fossil that was discovered by Neil Shubin uh, as he was walking, was found on the ground. And in this material, the scales are quite you know, white and different from the matrix around it. So it attracts your eye. And as he found it just on the surface of the ground, he began looking for other materials nearby that might be part of that same individual. And ultimately was able to find parts of the lower jaw and a number of bits of scale uh, that were assembled and captured and brought back to uh, the United States so that we could continue studying them, physically preparing them. At the time, though, a lot of attention and effort of the group, understandably, shifted to Tiktaalik because that was found a week later. There were multiple specimens, size ranges, all kinds of really interesting things, including a clear appendicular skeleton that was sort of the focus of a lot of this research. Um, but as that project has continued to develop and sort of move forward, it's left room to revisit some of those initial collections from those earlier expeditions. And it wasn't until about 2020, maybe December of 2019, that we really focused on this specimen, NUFV-137. And that was one that after physical preparation in Philadelphia had revealed parts of the lower jaw and synthesis, a bit of the dentition. And based on that, as well as the scales seem to look basically like a really small Tiktaalik. And so Justin, um, as he was trained to do, as he's really equipped to do, uh, began CT scanning those materials. And he and I were going through in the evenings, or he would set it up in the day, I would come in at night and you know, take it out of the machine and shut the machine down, basically trying to process all of the materials that we could. This was right at the cusp of what would then become the full lockdown in Chicago and the pandemic. It was, it was early March when we were working on these materials. And Justin scanned one of the bigger blocks. And on top, you can see maybe, I don't know, a half dozen scales that are just kind of scattered. But it's a block about maybe this size. And inside, to everyone's surprise, there was a clear, large fin. Um, we had no idea that it was there. 
and it was really, really excited. Unfortunately, though, this was, I think, the Friday before <laughs> everything shut down. And so we had this preliminary data. It was pretty good, but the resolution just wasn't quite right. And so that then was locked in the lab. We weren't allowed on campus for several months. And eventually, later in the summer, we were allowed to return to the lab. And one of the first things that we did was take that block, take that fossil, and cut it down because we knew it was, you know, didn't contain anything in most of the rock, and there was just this fin in the middle. Uh, so a, another professor in the department, Mark Webster, helped us to cut the block down so that we could rescan it at higher resolution and really reveal uh, what turned out to be one of the more surprising parts of the specimen. So the animal that we would name Kikiktanya that we named this year, um, it has in many ways features that are classically opististic alien, like animals just at the water to land transition, just at the fin to limb transition. Its jaws and teeth and all the organization of the head that we have evidence for looks almost identical to Tiktaalik. However, its fin, its pectoral fin, the same as our arm, uh, is very, very different from Tiktaalik and in fact different from any of the other close relatives in this part of the tree of life. So. The humerus, for example, is lacking a number of the features that are really characteristic to fishes in this part of history. Um, most of them, including Tiktaalik, like Pandarichthys and Elpistostegi, that sit right in this uh, part of early tetrapod history, have features like a big ridge on the underside of the humerus, that's called the ventral ridge. Kikiktania lacks that entirely, suggesting that it's sort of overall construction and muscular organization was quite different from these other animals. That ridge is one of the features that people use to understand the posture of the appendicular skeleton, um, sort of how it would have been sitting relative to the girdle. Additionally, besides that, it was quite um, narrow in its depth. So whereas something like Tiktaalik has a really chunky, fat 3D humerus, this was a, a lot more narrow. And that narrowness was not just on the near parts of the endoskeleton, but it was throughout the whole fin. Additionally, the fin web, those fin rays, those dermal skeletal elements I mentioned that are missing in limbed vertebrates, things with fingers, but present in fins, um, that fin web, those fin rays were very large, larger than you would see in Tiktaalik, where they extend only a little bit beyond the endoskeleton. So if they have bones just like we do with a fin web that stretches beyond it, Kikiktanya had a really large fin web, long fin rays. Uh, this suggested, in addition, in combination with the endoskeleton, a really different lifestyle. Um, this is a fin that seems to be built more for controlling flow and swimming than for any kind of engagement or interaction with the substrate, any kind of cropping behaviors or any kind of walking, whether under underwater walking or um, at the water's edge. Beyond that, we had a, a really beautiful set of scales that we could look at, and included in them were a very small number, but I think really important type of scale called lateral line scales. So. If you look at a trout or a goldfish, they have these specialized scales along their trunk in which mm -hmm. the lateral line system is uh, housed. And that lateral line system is what these fishes use to detect flow and movement of water in the environment. It's really important for gathering information about what's around them. Kikiktanya also had lateral line scales. Um, this is the first observation of that type of anatomical feature in the tetrapodomorph fishes. It doesn't mean that they weren't present in the other ones, but it at least means that we definitely know where this animal was living. And we only see lateral line scales in animals that are living in the water. So in combination with the fin um, and these scales, we can squarely place this as a fully aquatic early tetrapodomorph fish. And the other interesting feature about this fossil is its size. It's significantly smaller than the other Elpistostegalians that have been described. Um, Elpistostegi, Pandarichthys, Tiktaalik, all of these animals are quite large, as I mentioned. Tiktaalik, we have jaws that are estimated to be from animals about um, two and a half meters in length, almost eight feet long. Uh, Kikiktanya, by contrast, is about, I think, at most 30 inches, based on how we've sort of interpreted the scaling from other closely related animals. So a small animal, um, a small individual at least, that would have been living in open waters using its fins to swim. Again, a number of features that are not only distinct from its close relatives, but kind of surprising because as we think about the ecology and evolution of this group, most of our 
data has come from these few, very few specimens that are, if you plot them on a phylogeny, if you look at them on the tree of life, seem to be showing kind of a graded transition of more and more walking, more and more terrestrial lifestyles. And to find this animal nested within this group, nested within the Opisthotegalians with adaptations for swimming um, was surprising to us. And not only is it surprising that it's kind of swimming and using its fins in this way with a big uh, paddle, um, but the way that it's doing it is radically different from any of the other animals, even the earlier animals that would have had adaptations for open water swimming. And so uh, it's to us a really exciting finding because it shows that at this transition from water to land, as animals were adapting for nearshore environments, um, for interacting with the ground, for underwater walking, there was a diversity of, of lifestyles, a diversity of forms here that simply hadn't been detected or might not have been predicted before. Um, and if we look across all animals or other groups, maybe it's not that surprising. You know, frogs will sometimes live at the water's edge, sometimes they'll transition to life on land, but there are fully aquatic frogs that have secondarily um, abandoned any kind of terrestrial lifestyle, that have simply evolved to live in the water their entire lives. Uh, these transitions from water to land are not unidirectional. Animals are not only going out of the water. They can be either staying at this um, sort of liminal space right at the edge, or they can also transition back to be more open water, to be living off of the ground um, and more, you know, classically aquatic and less uh, associated with that, that marginal territory. Because if you look at all the press release when, uh, you know, not, not too long ago when uh, Kiki Tanya was uh, released to the world, uh, you get the impression that that uh, the species came out under the land and thought, I don't like this and went back into the land almost immediately. But obviously that's not the case. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, science communication is really difficult. Um, I, I appreciate your efforts. Everybody that's doing this, I know it's, it's really hard. Um, as a scientist, we work so many hours trying to select, I think, very carefully the language to describe how we best understand our fossils, our data, and the limits of the interpretations that we can make with them. Um, but sometimes when something is, you know, a popular interest, then it spins out. And I think, yeah, sometimes in reading the way this research was covered, um, I wished it was a little more subtle, <laughs> the, the way the language is applied to transitions out of land and back on land. And the difficulty is that we don't think this is something like, you know, a whale where they were living, a lineage was living on land for a long time and then marched back into the sea and became aquatic as a fully secondary thing. But what we're trying to say is that in these tetrapodomorph fishes, in animals like Tiktaalik, that we believe they were living just at the margins of the water, just at the water to land uh, boundary ecologically. And perhaps they were crossing it. They had adaptations um, to move maybe short distances over land. They were, would not have been elegantly galloping or anything like that. But, but a lot of animals can make do on land, even if they are built for the water. But among these animals that were just at that cusp, we see some reversion towards what would have been a more open water, a more like swimming adapted species mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah that's <laughs> I hope it comes through in the conversation that it's a, a, a subtle change but um, nevertheless I think a really exciting one and, uh, speaking of language of the name Kikiktania sounds kind of like Tiktaalik in a way is it uh, it was it derived from the same um, language up there the Inuit language yes it is it's another name that we in conversation with in collaboration with the members of the community there selected so Kikiktanya is a word that refers to the traditional name of the region where this fossil was found, the Kikiktani uh, region. And um, yeah, the, the name is meant to celebrate the people, that place, um, and to highlight the visibility of their contributions to these discoveries. Because again, without continued support by the community, um, these insights simply would not be possible. The world would not know what we do about the history of vertebrates, about the water to land transition, if not for uh, their support of the science. Thomas, how has both Tiktaalik and the newly described Kikiktanya changed the way evolutionary biologists like yourself look at the all important transition from water to land? I think Kikiktanya in particular raises a lot of questions and is really helpful for understanding this transition in vertebrate history. 
for paleontologists in particular, it changes the search image of what an early tetrapod or a tetrapodomorph fish humerus should look like. Um, the features that we see in the humerus of Kikiktanya are really different from what are seen in other animals, and perhaps lying in museums waiting to be discovered are humeri just like this. And that's one of the points we made in the paper. Um, if that's the case, then it might increase the total number of species that are known that have been discovered from this part of history. And really assembling an understanding of the range of forms, the diversity of animals that were here, is I think the next step in filling out our understanding of how this transition occurred. It's a phenomenon you see in a lot of different groups where sometimes our understanding of major, anatom major anatomical, major ecological transitions appear quite ordered and stepwise when we only have a few fossils. But the more taxa we get, the more discoveries we have, it fleshes out the tree of life. It sort of reveals that there's a whole range of ecologies in the early animals of a particular lineage. Um, that pattern, I think, has played out in mammals. It's played out in early birds. Um, I think it'll play out here, too, as we continue to discover the range of forms, their particular adaptations. Uh, and I think that's ultimately the kind of perspective we'll have in trying to understand this period in the history of, of vertebrates. When we consider it in tandem with Tiktaalik, uh, it's clear that there are both you know, general trends that allowed for the colonization of land for animals to leave water to live on land. And sometimes they head off in particular directions that didn't lead to uh, major radiations, like Kikiktanya could be said as kind of a dead end. You know, we don't see that type of form flourishing into a, a new major radiation. Um, and yet it is still, I think, a really critical part of the history uh, to understand both these sort of apomorphic features, these unique features that are distinct, distinguishing individual lineages, as well as sort of general trends across the clade. The other thing Personally, I think that helps me to evaluate research approaches and the way that our lab is pursuing these issues is the recognition that there is still a huge amount to be discovered from fossils that are in collections already. Um, we had no idea this fin was there, and it wasn't until Justin and the whole lab put in this huge amount of work to really carefully process everything we had that we could make these discoveries. And so not only is discovery sort of a, a process of chance out in the field, which fossils you'll come across, um, but it's also one of chance in the lab. And I think this really reinforced for me the need to, in my own work, be absolutely certain that you leave no stone unturned, literally, in the way that we're processing these samples. Uh, the other thing is that it raises a whole, I think, range of possibilities about what we might continue to discover in some of these localities. So uh, the intention is in the future to return to Ellesmere Island, to keep doing field work of this type, to discover more fossils and try to continue to fill in the diversity of creatures in this part of early tetrapod history. Between Kikiktanya and Tiktaalik, we're getting a lot of new fossil materials that specifically inform you know, directly the anatomical changes the ecologies and the biomechanics of early tetrapodomorphs, um, early tetrapods. And it's not just our group and these materials. Uh, new specimens are coming up all the time. Uh, a really incredible one came out of Canada called Opistostegi that was published in 2020 showing the full, for the first time basically, the full animal um, from head to tail in one of these creatures closely related to early tetrapods. And as we take these anatomical features we're, and these specimens, we're trying to map them and relate them to uh, things like trackways as we try to understand the behavior and the ecology of early tetrapodomorphs and early tetrapods. I think the difficulty is in any form function mapping, as any biomechanist will tell you, that it, it can be quite challenging to make those links. And so um, I think if we want to understand things like trackways and how they relate to forms um, that are known in the fossil record, it will be and will continue to be informative to consider living diversity, to look at the behavior and the anatomy of fishes, to understand how they walk underwater, when they leave land, why they leave land, the type of trackways that they leave behind. Um, this is an effort that requires integration of many approaches, many different scientists. And that's part of the reason this is such a fun problem space to work on. Uh, there's no one data set 
that'll be the smoking, you know, smoking gun for how this happened. It takes conversations across fields, collaborations of many different scientists to really flesh out the, the true history of what happened. Well, the good news is that today, perhaps more than ever, information about discoveries like Kikik Tanya can be presented to the world very easily and quickly, which is great news when it comes to uh, outreach, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's been one of the most uh, rewarding and surprising parts of this research. I think it's fun to have science that people are hungry for, that people are really excited to learn about. Uh, and so to that end, we as a team, as a, a group of scientists, have been working to make sure um, that everything we make is available to the public. So the raw scans of these fossils, the raw CT data, those are available on repositories for any scientist in the world to consider. Um, anyone can find them, I guess, on Morphosource. You just need to register your email address. Additionally, all of the 3D models that we make by physically process, or when we go through and manually process all of this raw data, we end up with these 3D surface models. We're also sharing those. So if anyone is interested in 3D printing or learning how to um, you know, manipulate these virtual models, you can look on a website called Sketchfab. And just look up Tiktaalik or Kikik Tanya and you'll find it. Uh, there are others on Morphosource. But the intention of putting up these resources from raw data to 3D models is that they can be used in the classroom. I know um, some friends of mine across the globe are printing for their comparative anatomy courses, for example, the bones of these creatures, um, bringing them in so that students can engage with them directly, which is a really important part of learning anatomy. Um, but beyond sort of university level education, I think this is uh, a subject that is intuitive enough and tractable and exciting enough that uh, it has implications for all sort of high school, middle school, ele elementary school level education. And so we're continuing trying to develop those modules so that students and teachers can talk about this science um, using new research, using raw data so that people can understand how we do this work, how we make these discoveries. Uh, and then in addition to sharing sort of the scientific materials in this way, we've also, and this is part of the reason I'm speaking with you, tried to communicate the findings of our papers directly through press releases. Uh, and those include uh, efforts to get you know, to the communities themselves where these fossils were found. So we have a website and have written press releases uh, in the Inuit language so that in any individual uh, who has sort of um, immediate context, familiarity and kind of ownership over this land can um, understand it in, in multiple languages, trying to make it as maximally accessible to them as possible. And so that's hopefully something that we can continue to work with um, continue to move forward is this ethos that these resources are um, not only ones that have relevance to or belonging to scientists. These are um, heritage materials that deserve to be shared and really should be uh, celebrated as open open data sets. And all those links that you mentioned, Morphosaurus, uh, et cetera, they're going to be available in the description below for people to click on. So what about new and future projects? Is there anything you and your team are working on uh, that you can let us in on? Oh, there, there's lots of new things. So I'm just setting up my lab. I've been at Penn State for a few months, and we're really trying to um, yeah, discover exactly where we're going. But I think we've got a number of things in the work that are exciting, and um, hopefully we'll be out soon. So first, in terms of the Arctic materials and future directions for those efforts, the intention is to go back to the Arctic, and the intention is to find more fossils and spend time there and try to fully flesh out what was of living in the ecosystems of Ellesmere Island back about 375 million years ago. Um, beyond get collecting new materials, the goal is to continue studying those that exist in collections today. The type specimen of Tiktaalik is one we've been working on discovering for the first time its vertebral skeleton. And that's allowed for us to make new reconstructions of how perhaps the hind limbs would have sat and how the animal would have moved. So we're continuing to make even really basic discoveries and descriptions of this really iconic animal. It's not its all, not all known. We've got a lot to do still to understand Tiktaalik. Uh, in my own lab here, we're going to be focusing on living fishes quite a bit. So there'll be work on skeletal patterning and the embryology of the dermal fin rays using animals like zebrafish where we can use genetic tools to really dig into how they build their fins and how these fins adapt to different uh, 
uh, ecologies. And then I can point out one other fun project. Hopefully it'll be out soon. This is one that relates to the water to land transition, but it's of a different group of fishes. And so in collaboration with some biomechanists and biophysicists, I've been studying um, the problem of how blinking might have originated. So fish hmm. in water don't really need to blink because their eyes don't get dry, they don't get dirty in the same way, you don't have to clean them with the same mechanisms that we do. And so as fishes left the water, it seems that we evolved our blinking apparatus, the ability to close the eye. Um, and why and how this behavior and the, these anatomical features originated is something that hasn't really been characterized. And so to understand that problem in our own lineage, we're looking at mud skippers another group of fishes that have evolved to live on land for a substantial portion of the day. Um, they have independently, just as we have, evolved abilities to close their eye, to cover it with a membrane. Um, and through experiments, we're trying to show exactly why they do it. They do it to wet the eye, to clean the eye, and to protect the eye, just as we have. So there's a whole range of anatomical systems. I know for this conversation, and because of the fossil record, we tend to focus on bones, tending to use that to describe the mechanisms of change and how functional systems are evolving between water and land. But there's a whole range of other problems that we're going to get into. Um, looking at soft tissue anatomy, I think, is a really exciting opportunity. And so uh, the problem of how eyes have evolved to live on land, um, how they've evolved for aerial vision, is something that we're working on as well. It's tremendously important work that you and your colleagues are doing. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come onto the show to talk about your findings. I will leave links to your social media and research papers in the description below. And all stuff to say is thank you very much indeed, Thomas, for coming on to Evolution Soup. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. It was a really fun conversation.